What's up everyone, this is Marsman here, and welcome to Marsman Game. With the most recent news that Halo Infinite has reached 20 million players since its original launch in November, I think it's about time for us to rank where does Halo Infinite land amongst the rest of the Halo series. In this video, not only do I answer that question, but I also rank where the other games land in the series. Does Halo Infinite stand amongst the greats in this series, or does it fall amongst the subpar? This is Marsman Game. Before we jump into the video, please make sure you drop a thumbs up and subscribe for more future content. If you want to find me on social media, please join me on Twitter and Discord, which is located in the description below. If you want to be a part of the Marsman crew, you may also follow us on Patreon, which is also located in the description below. I just unveiled a new merch shop where you can also get this hat and this sweatshirt and they are very affordable, and I really like the designs. They're pretty badass. After hearing that Halo Infinite had the biggest launch in its entire history, I feel like it was a perfect time to see where does Halo Infinite rank amongst the rest of the franchise. To be honest, I am a fan of every Halo game. However, I can definitely pick apart which ones are better than others. When I'm making my analysis of this list, first things first, it's my opinion. So if you disagree with me, that's perfectly okay, and I would really encourage you to place which games you like the most in the comments below. However, I, when I'm making my decision, I'm going to be basing this off of the campaign, general gameplay, the multiplayer, the replayability that each game has throughout its entire lifespan. Without further ado, let's jump right into the list. At number 10, I'm going to go with Halo Wars. Now, for those of you who don't know, Halo Wars is basically the start of the entire series because it's placed as, as a prequel before Halo Reach. Now, what's interesting about this game is that this is going to be the first time the UNSC was going to face off against the Covenant. So, when I'm looking at the pros here, I think it actually has a very interesting premise. This is before the Master Chief. This is before the Arbiter. So, basically, the creators were given a very wide canvas to make this game. And to be honest, having a game that's an RTS or a real-time strategy game was going to be a big gamble. For the most part, console games have been unfortunately unable to master the RTS style. Most RTS games were on the PC. Halo Wars was able to accomplish this feat and make an RTS game that actually was pretty smooth. Each commander has its own special ability, which I really like. I like the music of the game. It was pretty solid. There's some pretty cool tracks like the Spirit of Fire song was really cool. And they also introduce a lot of characters that have pretty solid potential. I mean, when you look at Red Team, you gotta say, those Spartans are pretty badass. So the question is, why does this game land at the bottom of the list? Well, in my opinion, a lot of it has to do that they missed on easy opportunities. Now, when I look at the cons, and this is where it all begins, the characters are completely dull. They don't really have any sort of character or traits or any sort of life to them. I mean, just look at Captain Cutter. He literally is the embodiment of a cardboard box character. He has zero interesting facts about him. He has zero commentary, zero emotion. At the end of the day, it's like I'm talking to a, a, an actual box. When you look at the Arbiter, when you look at him as a character, he really comes off as an impatient douche. And to be honest, they don't really go into the fact of why he acts this way. I do like the character creation, don't get me wrong, but they don't really do a good job at, at expanding these people. I mean, there are moments where you have the profit of, of regret return. And hell, I thought when you brought him back, it was going to be a shock. You're going to bring some backstory into him, but they fail on all fronts. They don't expand to any of these characters. The red team is supposed to be one of the badass groups and you literally give them zero character development. I remember talking with friends when the game first came out and most of them were saying, I honestly don't really care what happens to the red team. The plot had many holes. I mean, most of the time Cutter felt like he was just like a, a kind of a pushover when it came to making decisions. And you know, like a Professor Anders who literally has zero military experience was able to convince him to do these actions, which were pretty far fetched and didn't really make a lot of sense at all. Now, in essence, I understand it's a game, but you got to kind of make some realism here. The biggest thing that is a failure to me is this loss of opportunity. You had a chance to really create a prequel game that could have been remembered forever. But you had all these characters that you could have expanded on. Expand on the universe, expand on the lore, and you failed to do that in every way, shape, or form. All those characters that I mentioned, you missed on it. You could have given me some information about the Arbiters, the past of the Arbiters, some backstory on the Prophet of Regret, or even the other Prophets. Hell, you could have given me some Spartan lore. You know, these are all things you could have done. And I understand that Bungie had limited Halo Wars in its scope. Even then, you know, you could have done more with what you had. And that's the reason why Halo Wars is so low on this list. 
At number 9 comes Halo 5. You look at the pros of this game, the multiplayer is the only reason why this game is not at the very bottom of the list. And the reason why is because of the fact that the multiplayer was possibly the most populated online since Halo 3. Now obviously in Halo Infinite took the cake on the biggest launch, but other than Halo 3, Halo 5 actually was very well played for its entire duration of its life cycle. When you look at the amount of modes and guns that this game had, it was pretty good and it was very diverse. When I look at this multiplayer, I really like the idea of Warzone and I really like the way that Big Team Battle was implemented. And now you have these multiple game modes that are large scale warfare. I know that the biggest issue comes with the microtransactions, but Warzone having that ability to play not only against people, but against computers, really made the game very diverse and you can play a new way or have like replayability of this game mode all the time in the beginning it started out with only having three maps quickly when you started adding more of those it made the game a lot better the gameplay is what's really interesting because it's a big change for sure but it definitely caused a lot more movement and it did get intense if you like that type of stuff probably one of the best things about this game was the forge now granted i'm not really big into forge just because I'm not the best at creating new maps and new game modes, the Halo community is literally top notch at map development. They created these game modes and maps that were so impressive and so fun that honestly, I'm a little sad that Halo Infinite does not have Forge at launch because they created so many cool things that make this game so much more playable. Now the cons is really where this game looks so bad. And it really just has to start with the campaign. The campaign is literally one of the worst campaigns I've ever played in the Halo. The story writing is, is god awful. I mean, it, you really think about it, none of the actions make sense. And you start the game, you know, with the common fact that Cortana is alive and she's the bad guy. And literally the game ends with the same premise. Nothing actually happened. And I think the worst part about it was that there is zero character development. I mean, you look at the fact that they were trying to force Jameson Locke to be the new Master Chief, and you literally gave us a character that has zero emotion, zero character development, zero background, and said, all right, he's the face of the game now. And honestly, it would piss me off. If you're going to give me a new main character to focus on, like for instance, the Arbiter, at least give us some good writing to at least ma make me like the person. I feel, kind of feel bad for Locke because he's been given this poster child role of being the reason why people hate the new era of Halo. Honestly, his backstory is interesting. It's just they didn't do anything to really help it. Other parts of the story that I hated were the fact that you had zero music implementation. I think all of this culminates in the fact that I felt zero emotion when playing and having no music here really just made it worse. It all kind of expanded my hatred for the story when we started to get this intense ad campaign, whether it was the hunt for truth or it was this fight between Locke and Chief where you didn't know who was telling the truth. I, I got so excited for literally a game that you know made me want to buy it and play it even more. And then when I finally played the game, it made zero sense. And the worst thing of all about this game was going to be the microtransactions. And everybody, I think, has a greed movement that microtransactions in video games is probably one of the worst things that, that could have ever happened. But Halo 5 kind of escalated that to another degree because not only did they bank on progression, armor coatings and colors and having new guns and war zone, all these things were banked on a microtransaction system that were only tied to card packs. I mean, card packs. You're literally asking me to pay for a fake card and then hopefully I get a luck of the draw and find something that I really like. It really made this Warzone game mode to be straight up awful because of the fact that you made it a pay to win style of game. And I, that's the worst part. You have an idea that's cool in Warzone and you make it pay to win and it just really made me angry. At the end of all of this, if the gameplay was solid, then you can kind of skate past a lot of these issues. But the gameplay in some cases could be positive because it's more high speed. But it was sometimes too intense to the point where it made you angry. It felt like I needed to buy an elite controller in order to do well in this game. And I needed to train like I was going to go into the pros. And as much as people might like the OP pistol starts, I honestly hated the concept because it made you not want to pick up another gun. It was just so rigged that I kind of got so tired. Tired, but I love Halo so much that I keep playing it and that's kind of what made me angry about this game. At number eight, I'm going to go with Halo Wars 2. Now, what's interesting about this game is that there are a lot of positives that have really been upgraded since Halo Wars 1. Now, generally, the story landed on its feet. I kind of like that you introduced a new villain in Atriox and the rest of the Banished. They were given much of the spotlight in this game, and I honestly love 
the start. The start of this game really gave you the sense that Atriox and the Banished were just this badass force that was really unstoppable. And especially when they set it up where they couldn't even be stopped by the Covenant, it really set you on that that mindset. They're like, this is this is going to be dangerous. That beginning, in my in my opinion, was probably one of the best I've ever seen a game start with. What I really liked about this game was that the characters were actually developed in a correct way. I mean, you compare Captain Cutter to Halo Wars 1 to Halo Wars 2, and they look like two completely different people. He was actually given personality he was actually given a sense of humor and people started to actually become you know fan of his when you saw this ad campaign along with what the game actually gave atriox and the rest of his commanders were actually given some store development and i really liked the way that they were portrayed here. the gameplay was smoother it, it made great of what halo wars one was built on it was you know easy for newcomers to pick up and play people who were veterans were able to kind of just step right in and jump right back to the action but each commander had its own cool abilities and, and play styles that it made it fresh to play. Now, the biggest cons of this game were gonna be really from the microtransactions. When you play the game mode Blitz, which is probably one of the coolest game modes to play, the downside is, is that it's just like in Halo 5, it's a pay to play game mode where the more money you funnel into the system, the better chance it is that you're going to win. And I, that is so disappointing because the game had really upgraded a lot of the issues that it had originally. The other major con I have is that it has a lack of impact. Just like Halo Wars 1, you really didn't see a lot of significance of what the whole game actually had. I mean, you look at the premise, right? You're playing on an abandoned arc where the flood is still infested. That's pretty cool. And you're facing off against a new alien group that is apparently more powerful than the Covenant. That's even cooler. Here's the issue though. Nothing actually happens. Nothing occurs. The ending of the game is Cutter and Atriox staring at their battle plans. And that's it. That's miserable. Like, imagine playing an entire campaign on Legendary and that's how the game ends. No secret ending, no, no hype. Like, it's just, wow. That was a nothing burger. At number seven, I'm going to go with Halo 4. I mean, when you look at Halo 4, I was so hyped to be able to play a new installment of a Halo series where basically it ended off on Halo Reach. And I, I was a little like uneasy because I didn't know if Halo was going to continue again. And I just remember when I finally got the message that the Halo 4 trailer teaser was just was just shown, I was just hyped out of my mind. But the question was, can 343 really pick up the slack or pick up the momentum that Bungie had provided for him with this franchise that I love so much? Well, when you look at the pros of the game, I think it, the story was pretty solid. I mean, there were some things that they were creating that were brand new. The dynamic between Chief Cortana was probably one of the most emotional in my opinion the best dynamic i've seen since the original trilogy i mean giving cortana this rampancy theme was very interesting and it made me kind of have this feeling of wow there's a possibility that you could lose cortana and i think most halo fans were in complete surprise when you did lose Cortana at the end of the game. It left a lot of big questions to be answered, which is fine for a game that's supposed to set up a new trilogy, and it made people wonder what Chief was going to be like without having Cortana by his side. The other pro about this game was that they did develop some characters. I mean, when you look at Chief and Cortana, I feel like this is the most I've ever seen them have character development as a duo before. And then you're adding in some new themes about this game, where this idea of having a man versus machine, how much of a man versus machine are you? And it made people really get emotional about this especially by the end of the game and then you're adding in new characters like captain lasky he's no sergeant johnson for sure but he's definitely a solid character and then you're bringing in captain del rio and spartan palmer and granted they are just eh but at least there's something there probably one of the biggest surprises i had was with the antagonist which was going to be the didact to be honest i was actually really excited to see him introduced as a villain for the first time and when you see him he shows up and he just backhands chief which is very rare to see to begin with and he is a forerunner so you're seeing wow, the Forerunner is back, right? They're back in business. I wonder what, what's going to happen here. Now, the biggest cons of this game are going to become with the multiplayer. When you look at the life cycle of Halo 4, the reason why it was not as successful as previous Halo installments was solely because of the downfall of the multiplayer. With not a lot of content at launch and basically the fact that they were trying to expand on these abilities to become more important to the gameplay it made people get upset and i think this the icing on the cake here was that they basically were trying to copy call of duty in the gameplay in which halo is not really known for. having loadouts as being the most important thing about halo 4 was basically a death nail for them i mean halo has always been an arena shooter and now you're including loadouts to be long range shooting this is not what halo's built on i mean when you look at the stats here halo 4 when it comes to player retention had lost literally almost 
lost three quarters of the entirety of its player base in the first three months. Now, granted, you're facing off against Black Ops 2, which one of the, was which was one of the most popular Call of Duty games of all time. Even if that's being the case, Halo has always been a top-notch multiplayer shooter, and when Call of Duty makes the top in sales every year, Halo's usually always been the second contender in the multiplayer sales. Seeing Halo 4 drop to nearly almost at the bottom is pretty upsetting. Now, the other issue I have is that the flaws of the story come with the part where you're not really giving a lot of context to some characters. Didact had some cool, badass parts which it didn't really give us a lot of information about his backstory. You gave us that stuff or that information in the, you know, codex or in the terminals, which it didn't really give us a lot in the actual gameplay, because if you weren't really searching for everything, then you wouldn't really find that information. Del Rio and Palmer were basically just background characters that had zero involvement. Del Rio was seen as that antagonist that you would face off against in UNSC, and then he had one scene and then he was poof gone. I mean, you can't just get rid of a guy like that that was supposed to be the captain of the of the Infinity. I mean, what, what are we talking about here? And uh, the other big issue I had was that we had this new covenant that basically had zero leader the entire game, and then they introduced a leader in the Spartan Ops, Jewel Mandama. Now, what's, what's bad about this is that not only was he a horrifying leader, but basically you gave no reason why that he was leading this group. What was his purpose? What was his goal? Why was he even following the didact in the first place? He didn't explain any, any of those things. And that was kind of the one of the biggest issues I had with Halo 4. Coming in at number six is going to be Halo ODST. What's interesting about this game is that it's pretty high on the list and it's actually just an expansion. I know most people will consider this to be a game by on its own because it was sold at a $60 value. Now, this story did not involve Chief at all, which was a pretty risky move, Bungie. Let's see how you did. When I look at the pros here, I'm thinking about the music first. This is probably one of the best soundtracks I've ever heard from a Halo game. It was a very big surprise. You're having a mixture of jazz with some orchestra, which really sets the tone it made you feel like this was like some sort of a detective halo game which i was like wow that was so cool to hear when you look at the story it was pretty solid it's it's basically like a short story put it in contention of if you're going to connect it to something it's like a han solo film because at the end of the day it gives you some background into an event that you really never thought about before it, it does a pretty solid job i mean this is set in the context of what happens to new Mombasa after the subspace structure that happens in halo 2 so i think this is a pretty interesting premise now the gameplay itself makes you feel like you aren't really a spartan which you aren't at the end of the day so it makes you kind of feel immersed in the situation that this is a lot harder than previous games where you can't just run and gun you got to be smart with your interactions the fact that you're playing like almost a detective investigative campaign where you're trying to find out what happened to your squad is pretty cool the other pro i liked about this game was the squad itself alpha 9 was an actually very good unit it, this kind of reminds me to a lot of those war movie crews where it's like each one has their own personality each one has their traits and the fact you get to play through almost every character here is a pretty cool thing it get, puts you in the mindset and it, it literally in the shoes of each character as you play through the story itself the rookie being a silent protagonist like a master chief so that you live through his eyes and you you kind of every thought that you have is the same thought that rookie has buck being like an instant legend in this game shows you how well the writing was and you got to give joseph staten a lot of credit here the cons of this game really have to do with the fact that this game literally doesn't have any major plot impact in the mainline story now i granted i understand that at the end of the game they end up finding an engineer covenant engineer and this species basically helps them locate where the arc is going to be in halo 3 they never once mentioned this in Halo 3 they never once mentioned this in any other aspect of the story so i feel like this is just kind of like an added like oh this is why this game's important you know i feel like even if they were to just say this is a a, a certain spot of the story and you even have chief like in a certain way like you help chief in a major mission that would be pretty cool this doesn't really expand in much of the actual lore it's kind of just a, a small story about a bunch of odsts that had a lot of struggles it's interesting but it's still just a dlc and it's not it shouldn't be considered a full game here and the other thing is is that's too short i mean if you're gonna make a dlc the be this way where i'm paying a 60 dollar value for a game that you feel like you can beat and sit in one sitting that's kind of not really fair here i feel like you kind of have to make it longer you have to make it a little more challenging i feel like that i kind of got gypped out of 60 bucks there as much as i like the game there's zero online component and that kind of makes this lower on the list because of that but you have to give them a lot of credit it made it to number six and it has zero multiplayer and it's straight up a dlc and has no master chief in it i mean you got to give them a lot of props 
At number five, I'm going to go with Halo Reach. I really love this game a lot, and it was difficult to make the decision whether this would be number five or number four, but I ultimately picked at this location for a few specific reasons. Firstly, with the pros, I'm going to start with the campaign. Obviously, this is a great story, and it's about a squad of Spartans that didn't really have any sort of showing in any other installment before. It basically created a mirror of saving Private Ryan, but with Halo characters. And each one of them, very similar to what we saw with ODST, has their own traits, has their own backgrounds, and we never really saw much of Spartan 3s before, so this was definitely a twist that we didn't really see coming. The story gives us the mindset that this is the first time that the UNSC had realized that the Covenant was going to be on reach. Every single Spartan here went out like a badass. When you look at the gameplay of this game, it's like a slightly faster version of Halo 3, but instead of equipment, they're going to replace it with abilities. When you compare this game to what Destiny 1 ended up becoming, they're actually not that far off, and it feels as if this was the precursor to kind of Bungie testing out Destiny's gameplay and seeing how the public like. Now, what's interesting about this game is that abilities that they use are very diverse and it gives the player the ability to play their own way. I really like the fact that they give you this diversity and they give you the ability to kind of be your own player in this in this universe. The fact is, if you're a more sneaking guy, use camo. If you're more of a vanguard, then pick up the armor lock. At the end of the day, it gives you a lot of choice and that's always good in a Halo game. The music of the game was done very well. I kind of like the way that they set it up where it sounds like a lot of violin. It makes it sound like you're in a desert constantly. And I, I really enjoy the callbacks to some old songs as well as some new themes that were introduced. When it comes to the multiplayer, the maps are pretty good too. One of my favorite maps of all time, which is Spire, is literally still to this day my one of my top five out there. When you look at Spire, it has the central pillar of the entire map is a Spire, and basically all the fighting happens here. And most of the maps I saw were all pretty good. The game modes are pretty solid too. I ended up adding a lot of different things to play. For example, Infection and Heavies were probably one of my favorite things to do. And it gave you so many different ways to play it, which is obviously a good thing to see. They also introduced new guns in this game. The fact is you're getting the DMR, which is a semi-automatic with no BR even found in sight, as well as some new guns like the grenade launcher which to this day one of my favorites if you use it the right way you can straight up dominate one of the best parts about this game though is the customizations i think when you look at how halo reach utilizes customization with armor sets colors unlockables earning credits to purchase your armor it was done to perfection they added the first time i think in the entire series the use of challenges to help you earn not only xp but earnable credits to purchase armor that was so smart of bungie to do it made you feel so much more fulfilled in unlocking new things and you had to be smart with how you spent your credits instead of just buying everything possible you honestly had the choice to say all right i I unlocked this armor but do i want to buy it and it made people really be invested in how they use their credits going forward i think that when you compare this to a lot of other customizations throughout the halo games this is going to be number one in customizations guaranteed now when it comes to the cons of this list it's not like there's a lot of bad things to say about halo reach but there are some things that i definitely can pick out that do make it at number five here. One of the first things I'll talk about is that the story felt like there was not as much impact as I, I would like it to have. Now, I'm not going to say the Noble team is not interesting at all. They are very interesting, but they're missing one thing, and that's the Master Chief. I mean, at the end of the day, Noble 6 is cool. Don't get me wrong. He's not a bad guy, but Master Chief would have made the story so much more impactful. Like, let's just say that you added Master Chief to be the one that helps the rest of the Noble team do some of these missions, and at the very end, you, you know, you have Master Chief be the one on the pillar of autumn while everyone else sacrificed themselves like that would have been so cool and here's the worst part you could have added so much to the lore of halo reach you could have been like what's what what's interesting about the spartan program give me some more lore with chief and cortana i mean we've only seen some information about the spartan lore some aspects of i guess in halo infinite you really didn't get a lot of information about how would the spartans take it what was the process like we have to watch these outside animated shows to really get that and halo reach was set up to be a prequel game to all the other halo games this is literally the chance for you to make a background game about everything that's important that was missing give us some context about the spartan program give us some context about this how does chief and cortana even meet the for the first time you never really actually see that in gameplay and for anyone that's never really read into the backstory or watch animated shorts 
they're never going to know about that stuff, right? And that's kind of a flaw here. The other major flaw I have about Halo Reach is that there's not actually a single antagonist that you're going up against. The antagonist is the Coven, and that's about it. There's no figure that you're facing off against or saying, all right, I'm going to beat this guy at the very end. Every game, for the most part, has an antagonist has somebody that you're going to face off against or striving to get better to beat. Halo Reach does not have one of those things. Now, this is a missed opportunity, and I want you to hear me out here. One of the biggest villains at this point in the game is Vel Vadami, who is the Arbiter. At this point, he is one of the major commanders of the Covenant attacking Reach. And you're telling me that you couldn't develop this character to show some background about who he was. How did he become such a popular Covenant commander? How was he on Reach? These are all things that you could have done to build my boy's backstory. Arbiter is a badass in Halo 2, but we never actually saw him up until that point. The question of who is this guy before Halo 2 would have been such a good idea to expand upon. Even if you don't have the Master Chief, you could have added to the Arbiter's backstory in this game using the current Noble team. I'm just saying, I love this game so much, but you missed on so many opportunities, and that is a big flaw. At number four, very close to reach, comes in Halo Infinite. Halo Infinite has a lot of pros. And there are some cons for sure, but let's start off with the pros. The gameplay, in my opinion, is possibly one of the best gameplays of the entire series. Because it not only smooth as hell, but it actually feels like a sequel to the Halo 3 that everybody was waiting for. This game takes a lot of the Halo 3 mechanics and perfects them or adds good aspects to it. In my opinion, it fixes the entire debate on Sprint once and for all. It makes it so that it appeals to the old fans and the new fans to a perfect degree where everybody is in compliance or everyone is in agreement. It also solves the problem of the gun starts. For most of the Halo franchise, everyone has debated what two guns should you start with. And most of the time, people would say you always start off with a battle rifle or you're going to start off with a pistol that is super strong. Halo Infinite puts the perfect combination of starting weapons together. The new assault rifle, which is literally the best version of it in the entire franchise, and the pistol, the sidekick, and they put that for every freaking game mode in the entire game, except for ranked. Ranked is BRs, which is fine. And the reason why this is such a big deal is because the fact is it forces people to compete in short range combat or better yet go find a gun and then you can shoot far away this is how halo is supposed to be played as much as people can slam the table saying that brs are the best gun you should definitely use that for starting weapons and pistols should be longer range i'm sorry but at the pivotal top point of halo history halo 2 and halo 3 multiplayer the game was always a close range combat game always i really like the way the direction is going here what i also like about the multiplayer is that the maps are pretty solid all the way around. There's really only one decent map that is not great, but it's not bad. And for the most part, you look at the guns, almost all of them are balanced except for two. And that's literally the Pulse Rifle and the Ravager. Two out of 21. So that means 19 are pretty solid. The other major pro of this game is going to be the story. The story kind of lands on most standards. And to be honest, it has one of the better beginnings I've seen in a Halo game in a while. And it also gives you this new mechanic of an open world explore around concept that really gets me excited to see how the game continues forward. A Halo game that has open world is good enough that we now want to see this concept be used for every Halo game from here on out. And one of the best parts about this game is that the boss fights that they implement are literally the best versions of it in the entire Halo franchise. When you look at Halo Infinite's campaign, they landed on the solid story, they landed on the concept of the open world, and they landed on boss fights. The other thing that's kind of a mix and match is they did bring characters to this game. Some characters can have been developed a little bit more, but for the most part, they had more character development in this game than they had in both Halo 5 and Halo 4 combined. So at the end of the day, you're creating characters like Eshram and the Spartan Killers who were really cool. Master Master Chief is probably one of the best versions of himself I've ever seen. The Weapon and Echo 216 are very good side characters with solid character development. And one of the best parts about it all is you tie emotion with music. The music of this game is top notch. I love the soundtrack and I really wish they could just keep adding to it because it's awesome. So let's look at the cons now. The progression system is pretty shot. And the reason why I say this is because it limits your customizations of your Spartan to a certain degree, especially when it comes to color schemes because they're adding in a new system of 
armor coatings instead of colors, which makes me annoyed because I want to just color my Spartan the way I want them to. And right now, there's a lot of armors that are behind a pay gap or paywall that is only being able to earn these armors through paying for them in the shop. You can buy the battle pass, which is pretty solid for unlocking a lot of stuff, but I feel like you could have added a lot more here. Earnable credits are, are going to be available in season two. So obviously that's going to be a, a good sign going forward, but still that shouldn't be the case at launch. The other con I have is lack of villain development. You have good villains like Eshram and the Spartan Killers. Each one of them has their own character. Each one of them has their own traits, but I really wish I got to see more of them. I want to see some background. If you did something like how Far Cry has like these areas where each mini boss has their own region, you learn about them. That would have been pretty cool here. I thought that that was just a missed opportunity. They do have a lot of information in the codex, but it still would rather have been better if you played it instead of having to read up on it. The other issue I have is the modes and content that is added at launch. I mean, granted, you have 10 maps. Halo 3 had 11, Halo 12 had 2, but I just felt like having 10 maps at launch is just a little too short. I think that you should add at least one more big team battle map. It would make life a little bit more better. And remember, at launch, Halo Infinite had only four game modes. Now, granted, I understand this is a live service game and it's a little different compared to other Halo games, but you kind of have to add more stuff. Big Team Battle update just came out. And honestly, I'm glad to see that Big Team Battle is fixed for the time being. Um, but it's still unfortunate that we had to wait nearly two months for it to finally get fixed honestly you there are some issues with the desync problems and also obviously disconnecting from matches so you, there are some issues that you need to resolve here now i understand that a lot of people might call me a homer for saying that halo infinite is a top four game in the halo franchise but remember this game had basically picked up a lot of issues that people had and not only fixed them but like perfected them like the gameplay mechanics, sprinting mechanics, the boss fights, open world concept. These are all things, a lot of them, that are almost perfected by Halo Infinite. And honestly, if you add some more content, then there's not really a reason to say this game isn't a, really the best of 3 for 3. Now, I can understand the debate between Reach and, and Halo Infinite, but you can't tell me this is a bad game. At number 3, I'm going with the big guns here. Halo Combat Evolved. Now, some people might challenge me on this and say, why isn't it not number one? This game is legendary for sure, but there are definitely some cons that you can bring it down to number three. Let's start off with the pros. Firstly, this is a legendary game. It started this, the whole entire franchise. It changed FPS forever, and it was so simple, but interesting at the same time, and it made Xbox what it is today. The story, obviously having the Covenant be a religious cult that obviously was depending on this Halo system to be bringing them to the next beyond is such a cool idea and i really like the way they, they did it um adding in the flood masterfully and creating a three front war had made me really excited for the game entirely master chief being the ultimate silent hero made you kind of excited because you're living the game through his eyes and he's not really talking a lot so it's almost like his ideas are your ideas the dynamic between him and cortana was really interesting and i really enjoyed it the entire time map design of the campaign was really cool you had many different varying environments and on top of that every time you did something in a game it felt like it was important character design obviously chief and cortana are clearly great jacob keys was a fantastic character and leader went out like a badass for the most part um and honestly when you compare him to you know other characters in games you know he just steps in front of the front lines and actually does things which is great johnson is cool didn't really get a lot of spotlight here but introducing him is a great thing the cons of this game like similar to like what i saw halo reach didn't really have an antagonist that you're going up against i mean i would have liked the fact if you put arbiter or delvatamine as the villain and you face off against them and then you know obviously halo 2 starts with him being branded as you know as the heretic i mean but at the end of the day i understand that bungie didn't really think that far ahead because of the fact that they didn't know that this was going to explode the way it did um but i just think having an antagonist just makes the game so much better you look at halo 2 tartarus halo 3 had the grave man grave mind and prophet of the truth halo infinite had Eshram, halo wars 2 had atriox i mean you have a villain having a villain just makes you want to defeat something you know bungie just didn't really think that far ahead for this game the other con i'm gonna have is that there's no multiplayer at launch i mean at the end of the day it's not that big of a con because this game came out 2001 xbox live didn't even exist yet this is the launch game for xbox at the end of the day i can't fault them too much but obviously this is going to definitely downgrade the number to a number three instead of being in the top two contenders here when i look at the other downside pistols are just way too unbeatable and as much as people really love them to a whole nother level i don't really like the three shot kill i rather you actually have you know more of a firefight in this combat system instead of it just being quick and easy and being a long range battle. 
At number two, I'm going Halo 3. And at this point, the cons list is going to be extremely short. When you look at the pros, the multiplayer of this game, in my opinion, is probably the best in the entire Halo series. The map design is top notch, adding probably the best versions of the old maps to the game as well as adding some new ones. Guardians, I understand, is a uh, variant, I guess, of Lockout, but it's literally its own version, and it's it's probably one of my favorite maps ever. The guns of this game were very well balanced. The BR had to have some skill to do well in. The assault rifle was very good, and the introduction of things like the equipment really gave you a new strategic way to play, and I really enjoyed it. It created one of the best versions of the ranking system that I've ever seen in the Halo series by giving everyone a specific number based on the wins that you have for that playlist. And it really sets you up to play against players around your same rank level, which solved every problem that I've ever seen that Halo currently still has, where basically a lot of people were, were were complaining about, you know, how do you have a good ranking system? Have what Halo 3 did and you're all good. Progression system and customization is another top pro for me. The fact is you're able to customize your Spartan in a pretty simple way, having colors, having armors, and you do the simplest thing that you unlock armors as you progress through the games through your military rank. But they did add a touch where you unlock rare armors by completing difficult challenges, like getting every skull in the campaign I remember I would go out and grind to find every single one possible so I, I can get that Hibusa helmet. That thing was one of the badass helmets I've ever seen. Having the story be the way it was is another pro of mine. Having both the Chief and Arbiter be the two main protagonists in this game that you would play through the entire time is so cool. And if you play the game on co-op, one person is playing as a Chief, the other one's playing as Arbiter. Nothing better than that. I really love the Arbiter, so having him be a big part of this game really made me enjoy it. The music of this game was phenomenal. I mean, you have to applaud Marty O'Donnell for the work that he does. And literally the Chief's piano, that little theme they do with him, is still synonymous with the character to this day. It just shows you how good it is. The ending of this game is nearly flawless. You really have Chief going out in a blaze of glory. And to be honest, if the game had ended here, I would have been completely okay with it because he went out the best way possible and that end credits hit so well. The only cons of this game that I can think of is that you changed up the profit of truth from being a, you know, a conniving smart villain to being a psychopath. And it kind of was a weird change for me. I mean, I understand that the voice actor had passed away and you had to change it up. And the voice actor was not the problem. It was just that you made him completely different. The other con I had was that you're you never got to have the chance to face off against the grave mind. I mean, you've been setting him up for three almost three games now, and you never actually got the fight against. Him. There is zero boss fights in this game, and it kind of annoyed me because Halo 2 did have those, and you didn't really have a chance to actually do that same mechanic and actually face off against one of these big bosses that you've been setting up for the entire series. In some cases, the maps also felt too large in this game, specifically with the multiplayer. There were times that on Sand Trap or Snowbound where you would basically be hiking for like several miles and with limited mobility this can be very boring i really think that if they made the maps the size of zanzibar on every case then this game would have been perfect especially with the multiplayer maps honestly i've been debating the number one and ultimately i chose halo 3 to be the number two for those specific reasons but it is so good of a game and honestly if you haven't played it you definitely should At number one, I'm gonna go with Halo 2. This is the best game in the series. There are so many pros that you can talk about. To be honest, having the dual plot lines between the Arbiter and the Master Chief made me fall in love with the game right away. The opening scene is literally the best in the entire series. Having a mirror between the two protagonists having Chief being honored for his deeds and having the Arbiter being branded as a heretic really sets the stage for you and then they just throw you into the action. The fact is, some people called Bungie a madman for trying to have us play as a new character. I call them a genius. Arbiter given a comeback story that made us root for him was a work of art. You see that three for three? That's how you get people to like a character. Playing both sides of the conflict gave everyone the feeling that it's all about perspective. I mean, for the most part, people always thought that, hey, the Covenant's evil. Why are they acting the way they do? And now we, as we play as that group, 
we start to kind of understand their ideas and kind of say this is just their perspective on the same things that the other side is seeing and it's just compelling to do this and then as you play through the story you're just getting thrown into a tailspin when both characters almost die and then are faced with the other major villain which is the grave mine every mission gave you something and every mission gave you a twist and turn that made you want to just keep playing this is literally a movie that is made into a game format if you remember back this is the first time that a game has been elevated to a national spotlight and everybody was hyped to go see it the only con of this game is that one the difficulty on legendary was extremely difficult to complete especially on solo and secondly that you ended the game on a cliffhanger if you know the story about this game's development you understand that bungie basically was overzealous and they had to quickly finish the game in a mad rush and set out this story to be completely unfinished when it was actually supposed to be a completely different ending now what's crazy about that is that even if this was half finished this is possibly, or in my opinion, the greatest campaign in the entire Halo series. When you look at the multiplayer wise, it's almost on par with Halo 3's and it's only just slightly below it. Because the map design here is nearly flawless, one of the best maps in the game is a combination of both, in my opinion, Zanzibar and Lockout. If you pick the top 5 maps of the entire Halo series, Zanzibar and Lockout have always been in the top 5 every single list you see. I literally memorized the entire layouts of both these maps by heart by the amount of times I played this game. I wish every Halo game had a version of both these maps at launch because it would just make their multiplayer playlist better. Maps were even more condensed than they were in Halo 3, which made the gameplay so much more smoother and I really enjoyed the combat and the firefights that would happen on a daily basis. The only issue that I have is the weapon balance sometimes can be thrown off with dual wielding, but other than that, the multiplayer was, was phenomenal. I mean, this game was literally almost perfect. Halo 2 holds a special place in my heart because of the fact that this game had introduced me to the Halo universe for the first time. And since then, I've been a fan for life. Well, that's going to be my top 10 Halo games in the series. If you don't agree with my list, please make sure you drop your list in the comments below. I'd really love to see what you think. And I am always up for debate. Make sure you drop a thumbs up and a subscribe for more future content. You can find me in both Discord and Twitter, which is located in the description below. Please tune into my live streams and view my previous content located on my channel. I stream daily and would love to see you there. Till next time, this is Marsman Gaming signing off. Peace.